So now as we continue our look at oogenesis, we'll entitle the next flowchart oogenesis2. And what I want to look at as we go through this flowchart, and what I should have actually mentioned in the previous video, is to also look at figure 46.11 as we go through the oogenesis process. So that's a good figure to really summarize everything that we're speaking of. So remember, the number one sort of goal we want to keep in mind throughout oogenesis is to make a secondary oocyte. That's something we want to keep in mind. Right now I left you off at the stage of a primary oocyte and specifically we were left off in the previous video at the idea of a follicle being this sort of structure that encompasses the primary oocyte. So what we want to look at is that structure therefore, the follicle. So remember, our path to get to the follicle. We started off as primordial germ cells. Those primordial germ cells were diploid. The primordial germ cells developed embryonically into oogonia, also diploid. Those developed even more embryonically into primary oocytes. A female is born with all the primary oocytes that she will need for the rest of her life, about one to two million of them. And those will further develop at sexual maturity into about 200,000 uh, different structures. Those 200,000 structures is what we're going to focus on now. The follicle is what's going to be important in that further development post-birth process, post-embryonic development process. It's going to be seen based off of the follicle. So the follicle is a broad structure. It's a large structure that actually contains a couple of different components. And these components will each be involved in oogenesis in some way. First and foremost, it will contain the primary oocyte. So every follicle contains primary oocyte. It also contains structures that are very, very important in the overall sexual reproduction life cycle of a female called follicle cells, FCs from this point forward. Follicle cells for right now functionally we will just consider them a protective barrier because we want to make sure we protect something that we're trying to create with so much energy and time that we're investing in taking this primary oocyte and turning it into a secondary oocyte. We're doing a lot, basically. And what we want to make sure it's protected. We use those follicle cells to do that protection. And then also the follicle will contain a structure called the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida will be a part of the follicle structure that's going to be between the primary oocyte and the follicle. So it's between the primary oocyte in question, the one that we want to develop further, and also the follicle cells, I should say, FC for follicle cells, what is its function? The zona pellucida, as we'll see actually in the later lecture, the development lectures, this is actually going to be a thick layer of glycoproteins. And if you remember, glycoproteins are important in cell signaling. We'll see how that plays a big role in development and the overall fertilization process of sperm and egg a little bit later in bio too. But for right now, know these three components. This is going to create and give you one big follicle cell, follicle structure. So these are the components. What we have to do, remember, is take this primary oocyte, turn it into a secondary oocyte, and that's how we sort of complete oogenesis. So let's take a look. What's going to happen in this follicle structure is the following. Each month, and this is a cyclical process, that therefore it's each month, about every 28 days, what we're going to notice is that 6 to 12 follicles of all of the primary oocytes, all of the potentially uh, maturing sexual uh, gametes that the female has, 6 to 12 of them will mature every month. These will be the ones that are chosen, let's say, for maturity. And this is obviously after the person has gone through puberty. And so what's going to happen is that the primary oocyte within each of these 6 to 12 follicles grows. Primary oocyte grows, just like these maturing follicles are maturing, that means the primary oocyte will also within that be maturing, and the follicle cells within this structure also divide. They get more numerous. Okay, these are the, that's the reason why we have these 6 to 12 maturing. That's what it means. After about one week, so after about one week, the initial one week, one follicle is going to be larger than the others. So one follicle that contains all three components that we mentioned before is larger than the others. So out of these 6 to 12, one will be the largest. That's the one that actually continues to grow and develop. It goes and continues this process of grow and development. Continues growth and also development. 
Okay, what about the other ones? The others stop. They actually stop and they disintegrate. They are not, let's say, the chosen ones. Only one out of these 6 to 12 will be the one that will be involved specifically in ovulation and in the overall oogenesis process. Okay, So there's a lot of energy invested in this, and we want to make sure we get a perfect secondary oocyte for a potential fertilization event. So let's look at this primary oocyte in a little bit more detail as it's maturing within this chosen follicle. So the primary oocyte, as we'll do right over here, there's a little bit more we need to know about it. This is going to be a structure that as this maturation process is happening, as sexual maturity has been reached, let's say, through the hormonal sort of guidance, it completes meiosis 1. Because remember, it was arrested at prophase 1, and it then completes meiosis 1 as the follicle grows. And this is going to be about 8 to 10 hours before it's released from the ovary, before release from ovary. So there's going to be this time at which you have 8 to 10 hours of completion of development, of further development, and the release from the ovary is the point of ovulation, as we'll see later on. What we notice is that in this completion of meiosis 1, remember, meiosis is a division of cells. At the end of meiosis 1, you're going to divide cells. They're going to actually separate. You're going to get two daughter cells. But what we notice in this meiosis 1 of oogenesis, it's actually kind of weird because at the end, you get something known as unequal cytokinesis. You get something known as unequal cytokinesis. Cytokinesis just means cell splitting. You're going to have one daughter cell after meiosis 1 that's going to be known as a polar body. So it's going to be known as a polar body. And remember, after meiosis 1, we are now no longer diploid. The primary uh, oocytes were diploid. Now this is a haploid structure, and you also will get a different structure known as a secondary oocyte. And remember, that was our goal. Keep this in mind. This is a big, big point right here. At the end of this unequal cytokinesis, we get the secondary oocyte that we so desperately have been waiting for for a very long time in this development of oogenesis. Now, what is this polar body? The polar body, because it's unequal cytokinesis, one cell is going to be bigger than the other. The polar body is the smaller one. This is just the smaller cell, and this is a smaller cell will disintegrate. It goes away. It disintegrates. Now, why do we need a bigger secondary oocyte cell? Why don't we just have equal cytokinesis? Remember, we always state that the egg, and in relation to, let's say, the sperm, is always large. It's always a large egg. It's a large non motile egg. And that large egg contains a lot of nutrients. It contains a lot of, of, of all of the uh, organelles and mitochondria and everything that this hopefully developing embryo needs initially, that zygote initially needs, and thus it's going to be a large structure. And that's the secondary oocyte in a nutshell. It's a larger cell because it contains more stuff, and it contains more stuff because it needs to for the development of a zygote. But specifically what we want to remember is that it's a larger cell and it's actually going to then be arrested at metaphase 2. Now, why is it arrested again? Why doesn't it just finish meiosis, you might be asking? Well, that's something we'll answer when we get to development and look at the fertilization process of sperm and egg in a little bit more detail. Finally, after primary oocyte sort of unequal cytokinesis has happened, this secondary oocyte has to be released. It can't just stay within the ovary, because right now all we've been talking about is things that are happening within the ovary. Oogenesis happens in the ovary, but at the end of oogenesis, you need to remove and release this gold, this structure that you wanted, and put it into the oviduct. And that's exactly what happens during a process known as ovulation. Ovulation is going to be when the secondary oocyte matures, so it has developed into a mature egg cell, mature ovum, and it moves to the ovary surface. Moves to the ovary surface. Okay, once it's at the surface, what's the next step? What's going to happen is because it's within a follicle still, and the follicle contains structures known as follicle cells, those follicle cells are going to help out this secondary oocyte. Remember, the secondary oocyte has to leave. It has to be released into the oviduct. The follicle cells will help in that process because follicle cells secrete fluid. They secrete also estrogen 
and they also secrete something very important for the release of this secondary oocyte called proteolytic enzymes. These proteolytic enzymes are going to be the specific structures, the specific um, release, so secretions from the follicle cells that's going to actually eat away at the ovary. These proteolytic enzymes, they're lytic. They can break down things, and they break down the small area, a small area of the ovary wall. Breaks down small area of ovary wall. And when you break this small area of the ovary wall down, you're essentially drilling, uh, I like to think of it as drilling a small hole that the secondary oocyte can be released through. And that's exactly what happens at the end of ovulation. The secondary oocyte, the technical term would be, is ejected. It leaves its follicle structure, because remember, it's within the follicle. Initially, this is going to turn into a secondary oocyte, as we saw here. And then it leaves. It's ejected from the follicle and enters the oviduct. And this is in hopes of being fertilized by a sperm cell. Um, and that's something that we'll look at in later lectures. And then finally, you're going to have this structure that's left over. There's going to be follicle cells, a zona pellucida, other things that are going to be left over from this follicle. What is the leftover follicle then? The leftover follicle that is without a secondary oocyte now is actually referred to as something called the corpus luteum. You might be thinking, okay, this thing is probably just going to disintegrate like all these other things have been disintegrating. But that's not the case. The follicle that's left over is going to turn into a corpus luteum. This is otherwise known as a yellow body. That's what it directly translates to in the English vernacular, let's say. And the corpus luteum, as we've mentioned before, is the portion of the follicle that is left in ovary after ovulation. Portion of follicle left in ovary after, after ovulation. Remember, ovulation ejects secondary oocyte, stuff is left over, the follicle is left over, turns into a corpus luteum. What's the purpose? The corpus luteum serves as a incredibly important temporary endocrine gland. It's essentially, if pregnancy happens, going to guide much of the first uh, initial points of pregnancy. A lot of the initial first weeks of pregnancy are going to be directly uh, influenced by the endocrine structure and the endocrine nature of the corpus luteum that's left over because the corpus luteum secretes very important uh, hormones like estrogen. It secretes estrogen to guide the pregnancy process, and it also secretes something even more important for pregnancy, secretes lots of, secretes lots and lots of progesterone. Progesterone is a principal pregnancy hormone that is absolutely necessary for the maintenance of a healthy pregnancy, and that's what corpus luteum will help out in. So this is the follicle structure. It's a very complex structure that eventually results in a secondary oocyte. And don't forget that the secondary oocyte, though that's the goal, the end, the process that's left over, the piece that's left over actually is involved in maintaining a hopeful fertilization event, a hopeful zygote um, through this corpus luteum structure.